Um, I just want to welcome everyone to uh, this webinar. Um, I know you can't uh, see me, but I'm Seddon Thomas. Uh, I'm a research application scientist at Phytonics, and I'll be moderating questions today. So one of the things we like to do is, you know, if you have a question, I can then ask that to Mike, um, have him pause as he's speaking. So please bring the questions. We love uh, to hear them. So um, just a brief intro, you probably, most of you know, know Mike in some way, but um, here's a little background in case uh, you don't, don't know. Um, he is the CEO of Phytonics and was a former uh, VP general manager at Beckton Dickinson, as well as the CEO of Flojo. He led Flojo and its transformation to become uh, the leading single cell informatics company, uh, bringing a gene expression analysis platform from idea to scientists in nine months in partnership with Lumina. He's the author of 11 patents and was a finalist for the 2014 International Society uh, for the Advancement of Cytometry President's Award. Mike played Division I rugby, competed in Division I track in grad school, and is an ultra marathoner. Um, so with all of that, I'll let Mike take it away. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> Great. So a bit of a different take today. And so we'll, uh, we'll weave that throughout. Um, and as you saw from the title about plugging and playing. And so we're gonna step along that uh, uh, in the process of today across a number of different flow cytometers um, and, and share some data about what that, what that can mean uh, across a, a number of different uh, uh, instruments. The other thing I wanted to just say today, cause I just realized um, you know, you're, you're spending time from, from your day uh, with us was also just to start out by saying thank you at the beginning. We usually say thank you at the end. And I realized, you know, like gratitude above all, I should just thank you guys for spending time with us at the beginning of the talk, rather than very hurriedly doing that at the end while we're trying to answer questions as well. So I appreciate uh, you guys sh showing up to this and, and really looking forward to the, to the discussion we've had. Just awesome questions, so please fire those away at Seddon and uh, she'll, she'll also interrupt me so we can really have a, have a discussion at any point uh, along the way. And so, you know, really like to, to start out with the, this exponential graph that many of us are familiar with, where we've got colors on the y-axis and the year achieved on the x. And, you know, I think we've always essentially assumed we have our own Moore's law in flow cytometry. There are the number of colors doubles every 10 years, right? And we move from naturally occurring dyes into the tandems, into the quantum dots, into the brilliant dyes. And of course, we have our first six Nova floor labels. And I'll also just put it out there um, because it's something that we've been very transparent about is, you know, we've also said, look, at the end of June, we're going to release a whole new set of dyes. I can't tell you how many, but I will tell you that it's many more than six. Um, and in fact, I would say that we're, we're well ahead of this pace um, where we are doubling uh, every, every 10 years. And so one of the things that we're going to talk about today, because we're going to talk about the use of Nova floors across a, a number of different types of instruments, is that really if we look at the, the way that the interplay between dyes and hardware has gone, you get an advance in tandems and then you have sort of the response of hardware. Now we have to create a 12 color advantage or okay, now we've got the Q dot, so we really need to develop you know, the ability to detect that many colors and then we get the development of an 18 color LSR2. And so dyes have been really driving hardware development, but there's been, you know, I'm sorry, and I would extend that to say the fact symphony is in the very much same vein of that. We have the brilliant dyes, we sort of have the, the response of, uh, of, of creating the fact symphony. But we're in very much an inverted environment now at the very top end of this uh, of these flow cytometers where you have the Aurora or the ID7000, where you have sort of the number of detectors being up at 64, the max colors, we'll actually talk quite a bit about this today with some data that we've shared up at 40, whereas you know, you've got something that's on 188 detectors up to ID7000, but a max color is at least by press release, not perhaps by data, that says that they can do 44 colors. And so, but I think another important part of this is it applies to both hardware but also to, to the way we think around fluorescent labels, particularly in the way that we think about it, is that you know, as, you get, as you get more and more high parameter instruments, you also get democratization of 12 color and 18 color flow, right? That becomes a very, that becomes a standard mode of operating in a laboratory. And so I'd say that while we've done a lot of work up at this high level, we've been doing that you know, up, up at the level of the Aurora, et cetera. We've been doing that to inform panel design, inform the way that we create labels really for everyone and across all of the different components here and really thinking around maximizing the latent capability of every flow cytometer. So we're gonna talk about that in the context of the current six labels today and then bring you literally, quite literally right up to date with what we're working on right now, right? There's some experiments that, that, that Seddon is running 
in, in our lab and in some other panels that we're working on with customers really across this gamut. And so that's this notion. And I think there's two components in this notion of plug and play, right? And I think one of them is, one of them is obvious and the other one is, oh, that, 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 that may be perhaps not as obvious, at least wasn't as obvious to me. The first one is, how do these labels apply to experiments across all these different flow cytometers? I think that one's relatively easy. How do you plug and play this? How do you upgrade panels? And again, we're gonna try and step through that in terms of the com essentially the complexity of an experiment. But the other thing that we will address very transparently is also the way that we're even thinking around product, you know, pr having our products and the way they're even priced. And I think that's an important piece of this puzzle, right? Which is, you know, transparently, we do not yet have labeled content other than labeled antibody content other than our CD4 kit. So to that end, what are we doing to make these things something that where you can think about this for any full cytometry experiment? So we're going to address that very directly and spend a little bit of time on that. So I think it's, it's the equally you know, practical part of how this works in plug and play. You know, luckily the plug I chose had, had two prongs. We're gonna cover both those, both those prongs today and think about that and think about accessibility. So the first one is, how does this work across a range of instruments? And so I thought the best way to just think about this was, what are some things that we're actually working on quite literally right now? And then what are things that we've done and, and, and that we've shared, right? And so we'll, we'll spend some time today up at, you know, up at the, up at the, with the Aurora today, thinking around this notion of running at 40 colors, but only as a way of thinking around how that informs die-die interactions across all the instruments, right? And thinking about how to, what does that mean in terms of die-die interactions, what does it mean in terms of spread? How does that inform what we do? But we've also worked on two different, you know, really three different other panels now that we're, that we're proving out, really across the fact symphony where we're able to in fact go in and replace two colors and then add an additional two because of the performance that I'll show you today. We still have a lot of room, right? Because we see these as instruments that just have numbers of detectors, you know, for, for all of them, whether it be the Aurora, the fact symphony or in a tune, we see these as detectors that can be hit cleanly, right? And I'll show you how we're able to do that and hit those band passes very, very cleanly and not contribute spread, right? And so if you can do that, one, it becomes easier to design your experiment, two, it becomes easier to analyze the data, right? And so we'll talk about that in the context uh, uh, of, of the fact symphony as well and some of the performance data from that instrument to show you what that looks like, a, a really good analog for conventional uh, cytometers as well. Um, we'll also show you some experiments that we're designing right now on the Attune where you can actually literally max out the number of detectors. And I think, again, a really nice way of thinking around how you can leverage every single channel in a conventional cytometer, be it an Elsar 2 or a Fortessa. So we'll show you some work um, that, that's said in, uh, said in this planning. Uh, and that we're working on right now in terms of, okay, how do you stack these? And think about a panel that can maximize, quite literally in that environment, 100% of the detectors that you have with the first focus in on the blue and the yellow green side labels. And so, you know, one of the things that we think about labels in the way that we've focused in on this is, is taking just a step back and just saying, okay, when you look across all the different things you have to consider in panel design, whether it be spectral overlap, because you have floor fours that are leading and decided to lead more colorful life, right? Um, whether it be spillover spreading, which has a huge impact on the data analysis, something that we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about as we characterize the performance of these labels, because I think it's not just enough to have very, very clean fluorescence, but you should also be looking at the implications of that. In other words, well, how does that impact data analysis? Are you contributing spread in other channels? And then also this notion of staining index. We're gonna talk about that as separation index. We'll describe that in a moment as a way of thinking around brightness, right? And the final part of this, of course, is antigen density, right? And you know, three of the four of these are really affected fundamentally by underlying dye performance, right? Which in many cases is not very good, which we'll talk about as well. And you know, this final one around antigen density, you know, we take essentially fixed brightness dyes and we map them into low antigen density labels. We're gonna talk about a new capability today, which is actually the ability to tune brightness. And we'll talk about that also in the context of separation index, right? What does that really mean? How can I how can I separate populations, right? Because it's not just about being the brightest thing and contributing spill in every other channel, right? The way PE or PE conjugate might or some of the other, the, the dyes that we're using currently. What it does have to do is if you can hit it for, if you can have something be detected very, very cleanly in a bandpass filter, right? And then actually multiplex that and get multiple low antigen density markers and have the analysis be very easy. Now you, have, now you have something very, very different. So we'll talk about all these different pieces today. Uh, and we'll use this frame of mind to think around the performance of these labels and how that might apply across this spread of instruments. We have focused in very intensely, at least in this first, with these first six Nova floors that we've created, 
and, and really are, you know, a, a good bit of the second set that we'll be releasing as well, really on the blue and yellow green side of lasers. And the reason for that is because they've just been really lacking innovation for quite a long time. That, and if you think about the way I framed this up originally, from the Attune to the Fac Symphony, the Fortessa, up all the way up into the Aurora, these the, all of these have blue and yellow green lasers, or blue and a yellow green laser uh, on it. And you think about this fundamental sort of, if you will, where we started in the field, and yet we're still underutilizing those the detectors that are off there, right? I mean, we're, you, know, you can even think about that, like, wow, well, why does a Fortessa ship with a Trigon, right, off of the blue? Well, there wasn't anything to detect on the blue. Right, so it's even fundamentally affected the way we think about hardware. So we'll give you a different frame of mind on that hopefully today. But the other reason we focus in on this is because of the actual the underlying performance of the dyes that are coming off the primary, that are excited by these primary lasers off the blue and the yellow green. This is something that you know, all of us deal with every day when we're creating these multicolor panels, regardless of the instrument, right? And so we've got, Percy, you know, you've got the brilliant blues in Percy B, which are cross excited off the violet. Percy B is also cross excited off the yellow green. We'll spend some time on one of the Percy P tandems today. Yellow green and and you know the blue excitation of PE is sort of this bane that we always have to deal with because we want to use PE, we want to use PE conjugates um, as labels. I will say our frame of mind when we're designing these labels, because I think this is equally important, is to consider this level, this this type of cross excitation, and it's to consider not just creating one label at a time, but to create labels across the entire spectrum. And to put that in 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 the frame of mind, in the frame of looking at an Atuna or a Fortessa. You know, we, we take a look at manufacturer recommendations for how should you be leveraging these instruments in combination, right, with these, with these floor fours. You know, sort of one of these first steps you would do in saying, well, how, I've got just this, I've got this September sitting here. I'm going to leverage these capabilities. So you look off the blue laser line, right, where you just mentioned it, off the Fortessa, right, because you've got one of the detectors off the Fortessa detecting scatter. And so you look off the recommendations off the Attune, or again, off the, um, off the Fortessa on the yellow. And of course, what you see is that you've got you know, repeated, if you will, recommendations, because if you use PE off yellow one, well, then you're obviating your ability to use the BL2 detector, right? Um, and similarly, you see PE Texas Red showing up in two locations, you see PE Dazzle showing up in two locations, right? You can't use these side 5.5 conjugates in both. Something we'll spend a little bit more time on in the context, like how would you design a panel that does this? But regardless, you know, instead of obviating channels, what we've gone in is said, we're gonna go and stack our labels into the channels that are available on these instruments and so that we can leverage the entire plex that's here, right? So instead of running, as I'll show you, you know, if you had a panel, for instance, that had, in this case, maybe three floor fours, you know, now you can use all six of those detectors, right? So we're, these are actually the six labels that's specifically targeted to be able to hit detectors that are in this range. So we'll talk about these today. And again, I'll show you their performance and we'll sort of step that performance as we look up, because then you also want to say, okay, just because I've run this experiment on a tune doesn't mean I now want to take you know, a similar panel or use these colors and then you know, go use them in a higher parameter sorting experiment or use them in higher parameter analysis. The other way to think about this and the reason that we can stack labels is if we look at something like PE Dazzle, right? Um, you know, it's cross excited by quite literally you know, the blue and the yellow and the green lasers, right? And so we have this massive, you know, mostly contributed from PD, but this massive cross excitation profile and, what we've done instead is say, <clears throat> we're going to separate the excitation off the blue and the yellow and treat them as, as separate entities. And so if we overlay now the Nova Yellow 610 die that we have as well, you can see, you know, we can uniquely excite the Nova Yellow die off the 561 line, and we can excite the, the, the blue die off the 48. Right? So that enables us to go in and then stack these, these lasers, right, and leverage the, the full detector capabilities that are off those instruments. And so... One of the things we'll do, and again, we'll step this through, I'll talk about some experiments that we're doing right now, and we'll talk then about die performance across, across each of these instruments and also the capabilities, is what does it look like when we really talk about panel upgrading, right? And so I'm gonna quite literally bring you into the process and then um, you know, maybe Sedman and I can actually just have sort of a discussion, show you what we're actually working on quite literally right now, about how we can take an attuned panel that has in a conventional environment, 11 floors, right? Because of what we just described, and if we drop in the six Nova floors, all of a sudden we're maximizing the number of detectors, but we're doing it cleanly, which is something that we're gonna prove out. Um, and I'll show you that again with some high parameter detector. And you know, I think I'm always struggling to create visualizations that make this sort of relevant, right? Relative to sort of, well, what do we, what do we have in the nascent capabilities of these instruments, the latent capabilities, I should say, is I sort of thought about this as a pipe, right? Because it's the amount of, quite literally the amount of, of information, the amount of discovery that you could drive through this, you could do it well, 
So what I'll show you for each of the, the steps in this process is, you know, a conventional panel is the, this circle in blue, the Nova floors are in, are in pink. And if, you know, if they're overlapping and they're all the way up with the number of detectors, it's overlaying that to what we've got in red. So you can see we're actually maximizing the tunes, essentially keep inherent capabilities here. And so if you look at a conventional panel, and this is a, this is a real panel that, that, we're, that we're designing and working on quite literally right now, and you think about what you would leverage in terms of the conventional floor fours you would use to try and answer this question, right? And you'd say, really, ideally, <laughs> I'd want to use, you know, this, and again, this looks like a very standard, you know, memory T cell panel for RA78, PD1, 28, 25. And you think, gosh, wouldn't it be great <laughs> if I could just literally line these up, right, in the blue and yellow green? But clearly, reality, you know, gets in the way of this, right? Because you've got PE dazzle in, in, in both locations, so you can't. You, you can't do that, right? You can't put you can't put both of these off PE dazzle. That's just simply not going to work. And you know you can't use both of these side five 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 point five conjugates together. You know, so you're immediately down at least two labels uh, in the blue yellow green. And so you've got to push this into into other channels, or you've got to run two panels, maybe even three, right? But you know you don't have that data on single cells. Another consideration would be well, what happens if you've got a sample that's that's, that's rare or that's very difficult to get at? Um, and so again, something we'll describe when we sort of pushing parameters up. And so, you know, you end up with a panel that's a bit of a compromise, right? Which is, okay, well, I'll either drop that out of the blue or I'll drop it off the yellow and I'll only go, you know, with this panel that, that really only has, in this case, five markers, right? And so, again, we think about this quite differently, right? And so in our environment, we say, okay, it's great. We can get all those antigens, right? And we can put them all on this panel and instead of dropping them out, and instead of having the spread characteristics, and again, I'll show you this, we'll characterize the spread characteristics of these labels. Not only can I stack these in those channels, but one, the experimental design is much easier because we know we're hitting each of these detectors cleanly. And two, then again, this is the notion of data analysis because of the spread. Again, something that I'll show you. So this is the way we think around panel design. Seddon, so I'll pause here because this is, you know, this is mostly Seddon's panel design work. Have I missed anything? Is there anything additional to add here? Uh, no, I think you've got it. I mean, we, we've built out actually the, the violet and the red just to try to get as much, you know, uh, signal to see, you know, what's pushing on that system. But yeah, otherwise. Yeah, I'll show that. I'll show that in a moment. I want to just, um, yeah, it's a great point because now it's like, yeah, because that's another great point setting on the violet. I, and I had forgotten that. So we'll, we'll talk about spread in the violet because if you, the other piece of this, not an awesome point, because if the other thing that I had, what I had missed is that a lot of these PE conjugates and other blue and yellow green excited dyes do contribute a substantial amount of spread into the violet, which makes that analysis much, much harder. Whereas I'll show you again the performance characteristics of these, and they are, as we say, silent in the violet. So is that fair, Seddon? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I, you're, you're totally spot on. And the way, so, and also, I'll also show you some very early experiments where you just focus in on this blue yellow green space, just to prove it out on the attune, just to say, is this even possible? And then again, yeah, to Seddon's point, We'll take this up and then show you what it looks like across all the detectors on an attune, again, analogous to other, uh, other instruments in that range. So what we did, just to really push this and say, okay, is this valid? We did a very early experiment where we actually just said, okay, let's take a six color, let's take our current six colors and look just the TBNKs. Let's just stack just the blue and yellow green. So for a moment, setting aside the violet detector, setting aside the red, and just say, can we achieve, you know, the, the, that kind of phenotyping and then is that, is that stack? And what we did is actually compare that to a commercial TVNK panel where they had conventional floor fours, which you can see are quite messy spectrally. But I think the bigger point here is that you know, if you look at a competitor, you've got them come, going off of the blue and then the red. So you know, quite literally as far, nearly as far away as you can get in terms of detector rays on something like an Attune. Whereas we said, no, we're gonna actually put these actually, all these antigens into adjacent channels, right? Off of adjacent laser lines, right? Off of the blue and the yellow which you simply cannot do off of P and P dazzle, right? So it was quite literally, this is, it's not the impossible dream, but you would never be able to do six colors off of an instrument like this in the blue and yellow green space. As we discussed, you'd only be able to do four. So the question was, is that feasible? Can we even do it? Um, and the answer is yes. And so what we did is actually compare this and said, okay, let's take a look at CD45. And we know that we can get that off of Nova Blue 4, 530, which should do a very reasonable job in pulling that up um, off, off 530. Um, even though that's not actually one of the brightest labels that we've got, as I'll show you, we can do a reasonable job off of pulling out this, this CD3. Um, we actually, because we don't, because we can rely on fret, as we'll discuss, but we don't have tandems. You can actually see there's quite a bit of tandem degradation going on here, and you're getting some, you're getting some compensation issues as a result of that off of this TBNK panel, which again, we bought literally off the shelf from a competitor. 
Um, we actually get very beautifully resolved CD4 and CDA populations, right? And then we then, you know, sort of like pushing the, pushing the limits, if you will, because now we've got a very difficult antigen like 16 and 56. Um, so we try to put those off of this Nova Yellow uh, 660, which is a PE size, PE size 5 replacement. I'd say our resolution there wasn't as, wasn't, uh, wasn't as great. We were still able to pull apart the B cells, pull apart these positive populations. Um, so I think in terms of like, was it feasible that we could actually go in there and stack the blue and the yellow green? The answer is yes, we can, we can do this. We can do it very cleanly. Um, and it's interesting to me how this actually even stacks up to something that's commercially available that's being used as a test, uh, you know, off of, you know, two very different laser lines. And so to Seddon's point, now <laughs> we can, of course, think around what does this look like in the violet and what does this look like in the red? And I think there's two useful points to make there. One is we want to be able to upgrade the panel, certainly within the blue, yellow, green space, the place where we're playing now. But as I'll show you too, as we sort of expand out our view, we also want to contribute in essence, if in an ideal world, we contribute zero spray into both the red and into the violet. So not only would you be able to go in and stack the detectors that I'm showing you, leverage that capability, but you would also essentially bring the barrier for analyzing that data and, and, and thinking around the panel design lower. And so we'll show you that. We'll show you that on the Symphony and then also the Aurora. Because if you think about it, right, I have detectors now that I can characterize all of the dye performance across all the, all the different violet and all the different, and all, the, all, all across the red. So I'll have to keep that in mind when we think around, okay, well, we're looking at high parameter data, but we, what are we really looking at? What we're really looking at is characterizing a dye so we can use it just like we're going to here. All right, so we had talked about this in a conventional panel, you really end up with 11 useful channels because of what we're describing, right? But now what we can do is we can go in and stack these. We can put three Nova Blues off the blue laser, three off the yellow. And again, we've protected the red and the, and the violet as we'll show you when we look at the characteristics of these labels and really max out, right? And hit all of those, hit all of those detectors. And so this is some data that we're working on quite, quite literally right now. Um, and, and so, uh, but this is the type of, of panel design, the type of paradigm that we're taking when we think around leveraging the entire plex um, that's in an instrument. So I'll also show what we, what we will show um, is, is, uh, is, a, is certainly a larger panel and characterizing how these dyes play with other dyes, right? First across the symphony, sort of what does that performance look like versus other dyes? And then on the Aurora, how does it play with these dyes? And it includes all the other dyes that you're seeing here, which I think is important. Because when we think about high parameter, at least in our environment, it's a couple of reasons for doing that. But one of them is, well, let's go ahead and characterize its impact on detecting these other labels and, and detectors. And so we'll take a step back. I just want to cover some of the fundamental technology and then I'll roll that up into, you know, if you will, our next, the next way of thinking around this, which is, okay, now we've got a lot more detectors. Right? We've got 50 coming off of the symphony. But the way I always like to think about that is, well, what if you could design a fluorescent label? What would its characteristics be? And we've actually talked about a couple of these already because they underpin the type of thing that we're trying to do with upgrading these panels off of the attune. Um, and so the first one is bright and clean. I think we can all appreciate that, right? We want to hit these detectors very, very cleanly. We've actually already touched on this, which is silent in the violet. I would add silent in the red, right? Why not ask for it? You don't, you know, someone told me once, if you don't ASK, you don't GET, right? And so I, I, I agree. So why don't we just say, let's design for that. We'd want to limit cross laser excitation. That's become a by definition thing for us. We are designing to limit that cross laser excitation in a way we're, we're not thinking about this as, hey, we're going to go design a bunch of series of labels and they're going to be the brightest thing on the planet, but they're going to, they're going to cross excite and they're going to add spread everywhere else. We can't think like that because we want to get, get after this multiplexing. We'll talk around controllable brightness as well. This is a brand new capability. But the other one that's been really interesting for us, and, and I've seen some people uh, on the webinar actually with whom we've, we've spoken about this, and this is some new data relative to the last time you've seen this, is this notion of consistency and stability, right? So you know, this is also the other, the other notion of how do you make this, how do you make this platform really practical? How do you make it accessible from a number of different labs and a number of different types of uses, right? And so we'll talk about this. But one of the reasons that, one of the things that we're going after is how do we make these incredibly consistent from a manufacturing perspective? And just how stable can you make this platform so that you don't have to use special buffers? You don't have to stay in 15 minutes before, right? You can use these in a normal laboratory setting, right? We'll talk this, about this also in the context of fixation. So the fundamental technology that we use to do this is called a phyton. Um, and what we do is we take small organic dyes and we bind them onto these single-stranded oligonucleotides. And what we can do is assemble them, they actually self-assemble into this phyton structure, which is this cruciform, right? And this cruciform structure is what enables us 
to change the geometry and tune the geometry of the way the dies are interacting on our platform. And for those who remember the Fred equation, and I know, I mean, many of us probably sleep with that on our ceiling wall. No, I'm just kidding. But that scales with the square of distance. And so we can actually tune that distance, right, to get very, very efficient transfer of energy. And I think that's important because that's what gives us this tunability. So it gives us the ability to do what I was describing, where we can stack these labels because we can tune for a certain excitation and tune for a certain mission. And again, I'll show you the characteristics of that. And we'll sort of take that in steps to say, this is how it works when you've got N detectors and this is when, when you've got N plus 14 detectors, right? Um, and what we're able to do, because again, the flexibility of this platform is hang a single stranded oligo off of the end of this phyton and then conjugate that onto an antibody. Again, something we'll discuss in, 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 in some detail because the notion of this is just, hey, look, you can just plug and play these labels. And so, you know, the, uh, we'll, we'll spend some time actually talking around, hey, how have we thought around conjugation, for instance, in this environment, right? So you've got to, because you've got to hit all the practical components of this as well. It's, it's great to have beautiful colors, right? But it's also got to be something that you can use. And the goal is really to say, you know, we've got a kit where you can bring it in one day and be running on the flow cytometer, you know, the next afternoon, right? And I think we'll, we'll spend some time on that. The capabilities this gives us are tunable excitation emission, tunable brightness. And we've also done, for what it's worth, a little bit of work on tunable signatures, but there's just a lot of biology that stands between us and tunable signatures. So we'll, we'll focus again today on excitation emission and brightness. And so <clears throat> the labels that we've been talking about and the reason that we can stack is because of the performance of, of the way that we've engineered these labels. And it is engineering. Right? We can really design. And I think that's kind of the fun part is you can say, hey, I really wanted to be excited at this wavelength. I wanted to admit those wavelengths. We say, sure. Right? And that's exactly what we did here. Right? And this is how we're able to separate the blue and the yellow, in this case, you know, excitation, the absorbance, and then be able to set the so shift out so that we can then hit those detectors very cleanly. For what it's worth, then we, you know, we've particularly recently been on a big push to make sure that people can see the, the spectra of these labels. So we've published these spectra up on FP base. Um, and so this is, this is a, an open source spectral viewer, which is just a great resource. Um, it's got a lot of the in vivo dyes as well. We also just reacted just this week, two days ago, um, got our spectra up on Floral Finder. So for those of you who are using this resource, uh, the, the first three Nova Blue and the first three Nova Yellow are, are up now uh, on that. And so it can be used as part of your panel design when you're, when you're, looking, at, uh, when you're looking at spectra. Um, so I was, was excited to see uh, uh, their team get this up. Um, and then SciTech as well has also posted a, uh, us up on their full spectrum viewer. And, and I think this one honestly gives one of the best indications, you know, some of the, sometimes it's the simplest visualizations that give the best indication of what's really going on. Um, and you can see here, we're very quiet in the violating and we actually contribute no spread, which I'll show you. Um, we contribute, even though you're seeing this off the red, this is because APDs are very sensitive in the red, we actually don't contribute spread uh, in, in the red again, something I'll show you. But I think the thing to focus on here is just how cleanly we're hitting these detectors, right? So to us, a SciTech Aurora is an instrument that has 64 detectors because we do not rely upon the signature of a label, right, to deconvolute it. We just don't, right? So we, you know, you can hit a lot of those and you can see we've got a lot of room to grow, right? And so I think, you know, again, that's an evolving story because the other piece of this is that it enables us to create new labels very rapidly. I think one of the most powerful visualizations though that, that we have, even though it's probably the simplest, is we took single stained controls from the CD4s of our labels. And then we, you know, we compensated them, right? So we, so we'd expect to see some spread, for instance, right? In traditional four fours, we'd see quite a bit of spread, right? And we said, okay, let's compare that even off adjacent channels. And, you know, again, this is actually, uh, you know, this is just taking a look at it and say, okay, well, is there spread? And, you know, honestly, the easiest comparison here is, is there spread relative to the double negative? Because then you've got an apples to apples comparison. And you can actually see here that we're getting very, very low spread, right? I don't want to say zero spread because someone will say, hey, no, that's not zero spread. But we're getting very, very low spread, even if it's off adjacent channels, once we concatenate those single stain controls. And I think this to me is just an elegant way of showing the type of clean fluorescence and what's the impact of that. But again, let's go in and characterize these dyes a little bit. So we're gonna take a step out from the attune and then show you what, the, what does the performance look like. Again, on a conventional cytometer, we're gonna take a look at that on effect symphony. So this is the effect symphony that's, that's at the NIH. And it, they, you know, they took our labels and compared them to a huge number of other labels. And I think it's, it's, you know, now we're sort of, we're stepping up the, the number of detectors, but it's a perfect, you know, it's really just an extension of what we we're just talking about in terms of the ability to go in and stack, but really how do these compare? So they, they, they actually got, they, you know, this was early on, they had access to two of our labels. So I'll show you some data off of Nova Blue 610, particularly how it compares to this Brilliant Blue 630 and then the Nova Yellow 610, and then how it actually compares to um, these, the yellow excited dyes, and then also all dyes in terms of spread. 
And so here we're looking at the detectors, right? Now we're stacking up all the detectors that are on the spec symphony, five in the blue, eight in the violet, seven off the UV, three off the red, five off the green, and saying, okay, how does this perform to something that's an apples to apples comparator, this brilliant blue 630 guy? You can see that it's a lot less bright, right? Again, so hold that thought. We'll, we'll talk about that in the context of what that really means in a moment. But notably, and the point that Seven was making earlier, silent in the violet, right? So this has a huge impact. And then also silent in the red, huge impact, right? And we think around, for instance, designing experiments off the Fortess, off the Attune, because not only can we drop these labels in, we know we're adding zero spread to these other channels that we've got access to. And this was something that was, you know, people actually pulled out of our data for us and said, this is really important. Now I can leverage the violet, I can leverage the red with, with very, very low spread um, and use, use other labels in combination there. And again, think around maximizing the, the capabilities of the Attune. And now we're, you know, we're in through the Attune, the Fredessa, and now as we're talking the Symphony. Noviel was compared on Apple's Apple Spaces to Alexa 694, PFC 584, which is sort of a, also known as a PE Dazzle, and this ECD dot from Beckman. And I think we got some really amazing results, honestly, off this Novi L610, right? It was brighter than Alexa 694, it was brighter than the ECD dye, nearly as bright as this PE Dazzle dye. And yet, again, if we focus in on what we're seeing, right, off the violet, it's incredibly quiet in the violet. And so it's contributing you know, essentially zero spread there in the violet. And also you can see the cross excitation off the blue is, is quite a bit less than this PE Dazzle, right? So it has a big impact, of course, on the spread and then how you can actually leverage these in reality. But the other piece of this is, and I get asked this a lot, is how bright is it? And the way that we like to think about brightness is to separate the ability to separate a biological population because brightness is, I mean, it's honestly a very subjective measure, right? And brightness for its worth is in everything if you've got something where you don't want as, as bright a marker, you've got a very high energy density marker and you would like to actually <laughs> say, look over to want to tune that down um, and give something that has less brightness because I know I'm still gonna get anybody buying into that. And so what we did, and you know, we really, uh, some great suggestions from, from our collaborators. We looked at the separation index, which takes into account the 84th percentile of the negative. Because what you really want is not the brightest dye that has very, very high background. And what you really want is a dye that just is able to separate that biological populations and have tight background. And so in this case, what we found is actually the Nova Blue and the Nova that Yellow dye have the same separation index as APC in this case. And so we were really encouraged by that result and said, okay, these, these really do have some, some, some really interesting characteristics. And the final interesting characteristic, and again, this is certainly off the symphony, but it applies across, um, certainly back to our tune experiment, and as we'll see as we step up onto the Aurora, um, you know, in terms of the number of detectors, um, what that looks like is that the spillover spreading characteristics are, are, are really impressive. In other words, Novi L610 actually has got the lowest, you know, the lowest spillover spreading compared to all the other dyes that were observed, right? This 30 set of dyes. And so you have this dye that can be very bright, can separate populations, but doesn't contribute substantial spread. And then this Nova Blue dye, particularly compared to its really apples to apples compared to off the Brilliant Blue 630, really has incredible, you know, very low spread, right? And so this, you know, this is the this is the other side of it, which is that you want you, know, you want to use certainly all of the latent capabilities, but you also want to make sure the spread, you know, stays very you know stays very very low, so that you can actually analyze the data, and that you can actually have bright enough so you've got that great separation index. And so this is some work that we're doing right now. We're actually now panel upgrading, right? Leveraging these six current fluorophores. And so we're able to do this on adult, you know, a replacement in a delta of two, or, you know, again, the same thing, replacement where we're going in and replacing dyes and upgrading this. Still a lot of room to grow off the same thing, right? And as you can see, based on the performance that I'm showing you, right, we know that we can hit a large set of these detectors very, very cleanly and leverage latent capabilities are on this instrument, right? When we look at this as a pipe, you realize we've got a lot of room to grow in terms of the colors and the capabilities. And so the second part of this is really, what about the practical parts of this? And this is something we'll try, I'm gonna try and keep coming back to you. Like, don't just show me just this great flow data. I really wanna see, like, how does this work in reality, right? Like, <laughs> I wanna, like, if I wanted to use this tomorrow, right? What would this look like? And I think this part is really important for how you think about this when you think about the applications that you can, can go into in laboratories that we, that we can work with. The first one is this one, which is our room temperature stability. So we've actually tested out to three weeks, but our, this, is, this is just our labels left on a bench underneath tinfoil. No special buffers, no, you know, no magic. <laughs> and we just literally left them on the bench, right? Probably the simplest experiment, but the most beautiful. And you can see we get no change. So they are bench stable for at least three weeks. And again, it's just the longest that we've tested. We're doing longer term testing now. I think this is really honestly impressive when you think about it in either two 
context. One, someone who accidentally left something out on a bench, which happens. Or two, in the context of high throughput studies, right, where you're running samples over many, many days, you know, and, and now you've got this kind of consistency, uh, again, in, in solution. And it's just in PBS. But we wanted to push that a little bit harder. And I think we did an experiment that we didn't realize that was going to be really relevant for the current working environment. But what we did is we took you know, test cells and stained them with uh, anti-CD3 that had been conjugated in OVL610. And we just simply left them in fixative for two weeks, right? So I think, you know, we, we've been I guess, somewhat jokingly calling this the COVID experiment because you just, you fix it, you put it in the fridge, and you walk away, you literally even in fixative, right? It wasn't even put in PBS. And so we left it in 2% pair of formaldehyde for two weeks and then came back and ran it versus fresh. It turns out there's no difference. Um, and I think that's really interesting. And, and for us, um, you know, we really think that the DNA, the DNA has this natural curvature on the phyton structure. And so it stabilizes and it holds water uh, onto the structure and stabilizes the interactions of these component dyes. And so it's, I think it's really interesting. And I think this is part of that answer about what, what's the practical use of these dyes, right? And I think this is part of the answer is that you can do things and push this platform very, very hard in a, in a very practical, uh, practical way. The other part of this is something that we're very open about, which is our lot to lot data, right? And I think we've, we've started pushing, honestly, some other, some other, uh, other companies to start sharing their lot to lot data and say, look, what does that look like? And this is something we put up front, right? Remember, we're a new company. We're saying, look, this is what it looks like, right? We're leaning on oligo manufacturing to make these things, right? And then we're assembling them, but we want to be very open about this because we've also had some frustrations around looking at, well, because we started designing a number of different panels around, well, how consistent are these lots, right? And then also, what's the QC data look like? So we'll talk about lots a lot, and then we'll talk about this notion of QC. This is, these are just, these are two different lots of the Nova yellow and Nova blue dyes. You get under 3%, lots a lot of variability off this one dye off the Nova yellow and 4% off this Nova blue. And you can essentially see that there's negligible differences otherwise. We've also done lots a lot of testing on a flow cytometer. On our, in our facility, CVs range from two to 4%. And we just ran this and looked at staining index across all six of these levels at an, at a, a, in an outside lab. Um, and the differences there were not statistically significant on the staining indices. So to me, this is really exciting because it means it's something you can count on. You can count on it for clinical trials. You can count on it for multi-year studies, right? You, the label that you're going to get in a tube is going to be the exact same now as it's going to be you know, three years from now. The other part of this that, you know, that doesn't live in slide form but lives because we just are, we were just grew very frustrated with how we were, you know, some receiving our own, uh, our, our own antibodies and we were thinking about panel design was we have a commitment to QC on cells every single time. So every time we receive a new lot of label, we put it on an antibody and we QC it on cells every single time. And this was something we did very early on for an early collaborator we had, uh, early collaboration we had with a biotech company. And we literally handed them a data sheet that had the label that they had in their, you know, in their hands on cells. And they just said, this, this is fantastic. And we thought, okay, maybe we're on to something here, right? And so it's not on cell lines, it's not on something else, right? And I think to us, that's very exciting. It fits along this notion of like, of sharing the data and also just honestly addressing some frustrations that we've had as we try to push into this, uh, as we try to push into designing a number of different panels. The final part of this is controllable brightness, right? And this is a new to world capability, but you know, thinking around how could you choose brightness based on antigen density. And so the way we've done this, everything I've shown has been a two cluster label. We've actually been able to go from one to two clusters and then some recent data I'll show you that we've been able to actually tune all the way this up to four clusters. And a cluster for what it's worth is the arm of this cruciform structure. And so the first thing is the good science experiment. And that good science experiment is, can you replicate networks? And if you think about the structure, it's symmetric along the diagonal. And in fact, we can replicate that network. And that's that replication that enables this tunable brightness, right? And so we actually do get twice as bright. So I'll show you what that looks like in flow. So this is a Nova Blue 1 and 2 cluster label. And what I've got is the FMO, the label only doped in, and then the 2 cluster label doped in, right? So this is what the background looks like. It's very low. And then we can actually compare this right in the, in the histograms. And I think there's, there's a couple of important points here, which is, yes, we are getting, in fact, twice as bright, right? There is a stoichiometric increase in brightness. But the other part of this is we're actually increasing the separation index. This comes without the cost of increasing the background. And I think that's really important to think about, right? Now we're able to essentially tune separation indices, right? And you leverage this brightness tuning capability. So then we push that even harder. So we took this Novi L610 die and said, okay, now let's make that twice as bright. We do in fact see it's nearly twice as bright when we look at it on a spec, right? For what it's worth actually, when you normalize these results, you get less spillover because you're getting very efficient correct transfer. Uh, amongst uh, two of the four clusters here. And what we did is actually compare that to PE. You know, 
um, which is not an apples to apples comparison. Transparently, we should compare it to PE Dazzle. We want to get a sense of what does this do for the fluorescence, right? How high are we going here? And so we did is compare a two cluster to a four cluster phyton. You see, we do get, in fact, nearly twice as bright, right? But notably, look what's going occurring in the adjacent channels. We still have very low fluorescence. So we're hitting it very cleanly, but very brightly, right? Um, and then you can compare this certainly to MFI. PEP is very, very bright, but there's a cost of doing business there. You certainly can't multiplex low energy density markers, for instance, off adjacent channels, which is something that we're looking at now. This background that you're seeing, which I know is sort of very, it's like very obvious, like, whoa, that's quite a bit of background, um, is because of the binding of, of some of these Nova floors, very similar to monocytes and macrophages, very similar to the way that your side tandems do. So we've actually come up with a blocking solution for this, which, which I'll describe in a moment as well. And so we've been essentially deploying this in a beta format, saying, honestly, we don't know what's capable here. Like when we have this ability to tune up the brightness and go after low energy densities. So we've been working with, with current customers to say, okay, well, what do we think is possible? So we're looking into EV detection, P and P conjugate replacement, uh, checkpoint inhibitor simultaneous detection with a low energy density simultaneous, um, and as well as ACE2. So this is, these are just some projects that are, I'd say nascent, but part of our, our push to say, okay, well, now that we can actually tune that brightness, what's possible? And so without knowing that, honestly, we've kept that, we've kept that pretty close and said, let's figure out what, what we can do with customers on that. So hopefully I've shown you uh, those, uh, you know, some of the, these three capabilities and, and try to pepper in the notion of, okay, what does this look like off of a tune? What does this look like, uh, you know, off of a symphony? And, and I think, you know, maybe the, the final part is really now, okay, let's think around characterizing these dyes really off, off of an aurora. And the way we think about this is, you know, sort of, sort of certainly dye performance. But this is the same concept of panel upgrading, right? Because when you have these clean floor floors, you can think of it like this. And so you know, we have this conventional panel, conventional meaning, conventional dyes, right? If, you know, and what was commercially available um, was really 34 labels. And we were able to quite literally add six more, right? All six of them. Um, and of course, you know, again, looking at this pipe, man, we have a lot of room to grow, right? Because again, when you think about the paradigm that we have, it's not necessarily the signature that matters. To us, this is all latent capability. But we got a really great question that I think is relevant for, for this seminar the last time I showed this data. And they said, oh, let's take a drink here. Why would you want to do this? You know, and they said, what are you crazy? And, and I thought, you know, it'd be easy to just say, oh, that's a silly question. We always need to be doing that. But I wanted, wanted to develop that a little bit more because there's a couple of different reasons that we would want to do that. And the first one is just statistical, right? And so you know, hopefully this, you know, this, 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 it's, this, I like this visualization because it just shows like, okay, why do you need more parameters and it's somewhat obvious to some of us, but I think to, to this person who's attending our webinar, it, just, it wasn't. So I thought it's worth, let's build that out a little bit, right? And if you're trying to find the correlate of morbidity or therapeutic efficacy, and you only have one marker, you're never finding that correlate. And the, you know, the, the, the deeper you go, the more likely it is that you've got the ability to actually pull out that correlate of morbidity or therapeutic efficacy. And yet when you don't have those markers and you're diluting out essentially your ability to see that correlate. So that's the reason for more markers, right? And I would argue that's the reason for more markers off of the current panels. You can do a heck of a lot more. And so, you know, my sort of joke on why would you, do, why would you do this at all is because, well, statistics. The second thing I know is hard to obtain samples. Right? If you've got hard to obtain samples, you've got something, so we've talked to, uh, talked to some researchers working on pediatric samples and you get one, and you get a couple of microliters of samples, you gotta maximize that, right? So hence high parameter. The other one though for us, which I think is, I think is, is, is harder to see if you're not like living in the world where you're like, oh, like, what does this look like? And you're looking at these special plots day in, day out, is for us, it's dye-dye interactions. We wanna know how, these, how our dyes play with other dyes. Simply, I mean, what does that look like in terms of fluorescent labels? And that applies to all, all flow cytometry experiments, right? So you can do that and look at, really take the Y view on your dyes. But I think the other one, and maybe, maybe I'm just being very introspective today, is, you know, because it's there, right? And some of you guys might remember, you know, someone asked you know, Mallory, why are you climbing Everest? And he said, because it's there. You know, someone put an instrument out there that has 64 detectors. Because it's there, you know, I would like to hit all 64 of them. And I think we can go much higher than that, to be honest with you. And, you know, I think um, when we look out at other instruments that have even more detectors, like the ID7000, I, I have the same reason, because it's there, right? And so there's certainly a biological reason. <laughs> there's certainly a statistical reason. But I think there's another reason, which is that you know, it's there. And I would argue too, that's the same thing for the latent capabilities of our current instruments. And so what we're able to do is take this 34 color panel, 30, 34 of the 35 that were commercially available, 
This is this panel that, that, that SciTech has shared and then quite literally upgraded in the way that we've been talking about. In this case, we could add all six, right? And again, hit these detectors very, very cleanly. I'm not gonna spend time talking too much around sort of this notion of like what we're doing in the detectors, but I find it very interesting in this system because when you do drop these labels in, they hit the detectors so cleanly, particularly off the yellow, they literally push some of the PE conjugates to be detected as their primary detector out of blue. And if you wanna think a little more around the paradigm we're thinking around here, it's because we can hit these detectors so cleanly, right? And this enables us now to sort of characterize, certainly on the Aurora, but has impact on every single panel. What are you contributing in terms of spread? Because this is the most, essentially, this is the tightest pack panel you can get, right? Well, dropping in four fours there, you couldn't use together. And you're saying, okay, well, what's the impact, right? And the way to characterize that impact, certainly on the Aurora, but I use it as a way of saying, look, that's a great instrument to, to, to use for, for, for our own dye development, is what we do is look at the spillover spreading impact. The way we've done this is create an SSM, a spillover spreading matrix of a 34 color backbone. So if you will, this is sort of the base state of play, the conventional panel. And then what we did in second grade, this beautiful experiment where she dropped in one of our Nova floors at the time and said, what's the impact on spread? And this is really important when you think about upgrading panels across any flow cytometer, because again, we're in that packed system. So again, we're gonna look at this. And what we did is create these Delta SSM comparisons. So in other words, when I add one Nova floor into that panel, what does it look like in the spread contribution across all these different dyes that I could use, right? And it's applicable to the aurora, but it's applicable to any panel. If you look at the Nova Blue, spillover spread specifically increased in this brilliant blue and five, 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 515 and Fitzy. If you think about this in the context of other panels, it's actually not even relevant off the attune because you would just simply replace BB515 or Fitzy, right, with a Nova Blue 530. So it's exactly what you expect, but there's zero spread elsewhere. So I think these plots are fun in the sense of what you're looking for is the absence of spread. So you're not contributing spread elsewhere. The Nova Blue 610 and the Nova 660, little to no change, right? So there's essentially no spread contribution across all of these other dyes, right? So obviously very applicable to any, lab, any sort of flow cytometry experiment is that you can drop these in with little to no change. Same thing, so Nova Yellow 570, where you see spread contribution in the dyes that it's most similar to, it honestly you would replace as we've discussed on, an, on, a, on another flow, on a conventional flow cytometer, right? You replace PE with, you know, with Novi Yellow 570 and say, I'd use this instead. Even then the spread is quite low. Um, Novi Yellow 610, which replaces PE Dazzle, you see a spread contribution and you don't see anything else. Same thing for Novi Yellow 660, which replaces PE Psi 5. It doesn't contribute spread anywhere else. So what you're able to do, and in, in, if you ever think back to our tune experiment, is you're able to go in and replace these. But as I've just shown you, we've characterized this off uh, using this Aurora, is that it contributes zero spread everywhere else. And I think that's, that's really the important point uh, of, of you know, what we're talking about here is the ability to go and replace these labels, upgrade these panels and contribute no, no spread into your other, uh, you know, into, into everything else that you're doing in your panel. And that's sort of the, I jokingly call it the TLDR, which is you know, we've added the six colors at this, but I think for, for the purposes of what we're talking about, what we really are talking about is the ability to plug and play these labels, right? into current panels and really upgrade them. And so, you know, we've also created this subway plot again to make this data accessible and sort of hopefully interesting. Um, this has had a life of its own, honestly, for us thinking around how we do, you know, multicolor phenotyping. Again, it applies across all the different experiments that we talked about, right? How do you make, you know, the phenotyping that we do in flow cytometry relevant to a, certainly a broader audience and then, you know, take that in and then map the data on this. The other point though that I think this makes and that's important in the context of what, what we're going after is that we didn't just put the Nova floors on these high energy density markers. Sure, we have CD19 in there on a Nova floor, but we also have the chemokine receptors, right? So if you look at this, for instance, off CD40, we're actually pulling off, or CXCR4, we're pulling off populations, right, using the Nova floors. And you can see that across here. So you can see that, in this case, across 32 different populations, and we're able to pull apart those populations. So we went after not just high energy density markers, if you will, the low-hanging fruit. You know, the other thing, too, that you know, talked to a number of people about, and you know, we shared this data. And one of the reasons was, look, it's a great just resource for just looking at panel design again across any instrument because you can characterize how does this play with other dyes. But the other thing was, there's just a lot of discovery to be had here. Right? So if I look at the gray population here; those are the ones that haven't been manually gated. You can see it makes up quite a bit of the quite a bit of the sample here. And this is just off a of healthy human, right? And so of course you're able to do all of the the beautiful analysis off of this, but to the point we've shared this, right? We've shared the data um, up on our GitHub site as well as full repository um, and, and took this and published it in the context of a white paper. The second 
part of this whole puzzle though, if you will, is how much does it cost? Is it easy? I'll be very honest with you. We were so excited around the flow data, around the cleanliness, we had sort of skipped over this question. So we've sort of taken a step back and said, let's really address this. And let's also do something very interesting. Let's make these conjugation kits for single colors and let's make them competitive with antibodies. Sort of an interesting thought, right? And I think this has caused a huge amount of excitement, which I, you know, I, I love sharing. And the first thing is, and again, we're just like, here it is, here's the catalog and we're being very open about that. Cause the point about this is how do you make this so you can do it and try it tomorrow? And that's exactly what this enables. We've got CD4 kits for both mouse and for human. You know, mouse is off of the uh, uh, RM45. Human is off the clone SK3, so very standard CD4 kit enables you to characterize these labels across any instrument. So again, same theme as we've had today. Doesn't matter what the flow timer you have, you can run this and characterize the SSM and say, okay, this is what I could probably, you know, this is what I could do in terms of, uh, of that. These are priced exactly the same as, as testing volumes that you would receive from the other larger manufacturers, right? And it's 10 tests per label. The other part of this is we've come out with our own blocking solution, right? So this actually, you know, uh, we'll, it certainly blocks some of the stickiness that we see with some of our Nova floors, but it's the same analog for some of the, the side conjugates. So we, we've actually, uh, you know, sort of priced this underneath uh, what uh, what other uh, manufacturers are doing for, for a similar block or at a similar test uh, at a similar test volume. So we've had a, a lot of interest in that as well because, of course, it applies to the other side conjugates. The other one, and I think it's really the, the hopefully the it's the exciting part of this is that we've made. This, we've, we've taken the, we, we, you know, we used to just have a, a six color conjugation kit. We've actually broken that out into its individual colors. And that's what's enabled us to go in and having, start having these panel upgrade conversations where someone says, here's my panel. We say, look, you can replace two of these and then add two more or add, you know, all the way up to six. And these are one by 100 microgram kits. And so they, they conjugate up to hundred micrograms of antibody with each of these individual Nova floors. And we're doing that again at a price very transparently that is competitive with antibodies. And remember, these haven't been titrated yet, so we're not doing this based on number of tests, okay? So you're getting, you know, uh, and we'll talk around how much this means in terms of in terms of mass in a moment when we talk about the conjugation, but it, you know, we want to really make this very competitive with saying, look, now I can upgrade this panel, I can get a lot more out from all of my different flow cytometry experiments, and I can do it for, you know, essentially similarly what I'm spending on one vial of antibody right now. We've also thought a lot around rethinking conjugation, and so. We, you know, we, we went out and vetted a huge number of conjugation kits and found one that met really the requirements of Kent. If we were able to get this kit, could I be writing the flow cytometer tomorrow afternoon? And could I do it with low hands on time? So I'm, honestly, I want to be doing other experiments, right? I would like to be doing more or, or analyzing data, rather be doing something else. Um, and so the way this works is, you know, we activate an antibody um, and, you know, we're also adding on this, this uh, single stranded oligo and then you leave it overnight. Um, the next day you spin this, right? Um, and you remove the, the, the supernatant, right? It's because you've got your, you've got your uh, oligo conjugated antibody uh, in the bottom of that tube. Then we've got a really efficient way of, of doing this part of the conjugation, right? Which is that we have this oligo hanging off the antibody and then we've got the complement off the flight time. This turns out to be highly efficient, right? So we've seen 60, 80% efficiency on this side, 85% yield on this side. You can just heat this up to 50 degrees. It takes about five minutes at 50 degrees. You can do this on a heat block. And then you can quite literally, you know, we've, we've actually created our own protocol here where you can take this out um, and cool it at room temp, right? So this doesn't require any special equipment. And then after it's at room temp, then you put it in the fridge, right? And then you've got it ready to use. And so the whole point of this is, you know, you've got now a kit that is, again, priced competitively with antibody with a simple conjugation kit, you know, essentially four pipetting steps doesn't require any special equipment and then you can use the floor conjugated antibodies and then again begin titrating this antibody right and you have a, a large number of tests relative to the mass the other part of this too of course is like okay what are the conditions of this and the answer is they're honestly pretty standard right so this is a very detailed spec sheet um because we record the presentations and, and and you know i'm happy to provide this as well but in the other part the only real the, the, the real base recommendation we have here is just make sure that you've got a protein free anybody to conjugate to, because we don't want to conjugate all of those, every protein that's in there. Um, and also make sure it's at one meg per mil in terms of its concentration, right? Which as it turns out, if you've got a lot of antibodies that are hanging out in the fridge, because you're doing sort of max par labeling or some of these other labeling kits, it's very likely that they're at that one meg per mil. The final thing that I think is really exciting as well, because this also makes it 
accessible for folks and also gives them a higher mass. We can also take on custom conjugation projects. So at a MIG and a MIG of antibody and up, you can have a, a number of different opportunities to discuss this with people. Again, a lot because of the, the certainly the fluorescence characteristics, but also because of the stability data that I showed you. You know, where they, you can think about putting these into, into trials over many years. So with that, hopefully I've shown you some of the capabilities of this. Hopefully I've proven out, at least shown you, uh, you know, the most up-to-date information around how you can plug and play these. Also how we've really worked to make these something that is it's usable, you can pull into your lab, you know, if you will, tomorrow. Um, and really hopefully discovering more, right, because you can up the flex of current instruments. So, so with that, we'd be, be happy to take any questions. And if you have any follow-up questions at all, um, I know my, my name is, is, is somewhat hard to remember, but info at phytonics.com is very easy to remember. Um, and so you can email either one of these or reach out to Seven and I, and, and we'll, we'll hang out for a little bit to, uh, to answer any questions. And again, uh, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, hopefully some useful information. Sedna, are you there? Yep. Cool. When we didn't have questions last time, I think I subjected the audience to multiple love song titles that were based on fluorescence. I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like that's worth threatening for this one, but uh, we'll hang out for a couple minutes. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please let us know in the Q&A format, which is, uh, which is in, on your uh, Zoom interface. So. Great, thank you, Mike. Sounds like I'm thanking myself. That's for someone else. <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, that sounds really awkward. <laughs> oh, man. I'm just really glad that that'll be recorded now as well. Like I wish to sort of have this <laughs> zoom out taste. We had one, I think last week was um, someone begging at the beginning of it, cause I made a joke about me singing and someone at the beginning of the webinar was saying, please just, you know, I, I'm just, you know, it's early here. I'm not, it's not happening. <laughs> Great, okay. I think we'll, we'll call it. Thank you guys so much for showing up. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And as usual, we will post up the recording on, uh, on YouTube. And yes, I promise the person who I know will bother me about the recording <laughs> already. It'll be up soon, I swear. <laughs> so, see you guys. Thanks.